Welcome to Into the Deep, our monthly series of talks and lectures for seeking disciples. And my name is Sister Angela Marie Castellani, a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist and the coordinator for adult faith formation and catechesis for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And tonight with me is Melanie Keras, who is running our program from behind the scenes. So thank you, Melanie, for your help tonight. And thank you for all um, the members of the ministries and outreach office who are behind all of us as we try to offer some opportunities for us to continue to learn about our faith and uh, to live it more deeply. Tonight, I am very, very excited to present to you um, an event that will cover and will help us learn more about the life of a wonderful young man, a saint of our church, Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. You might have seen the verse of verso l'alto, which means towards the heights, signed on a black and white piece of paper on this picture that was taken on a mountain rocks in Italy with this young handsome man leaning on a hiking stick and smoking a pipe. You might be very familiar with the photo that we find here and there in the media and newspapers. And this young man is Pier Giorgio Frassati. He climbed the mountains of Italy, the Alps, expressing the endurance and determination needed as one strives for sanctity, to reach God like a summit. Agassi Young, Pier Giorgio stands for Catholic principles, namely for the truth. And our presentation tonight is entitled The Beauty of Truth. Uh, a truth which he not only believed in, but he defended and strove to live by it. At a particular time like ours, when our society really appears to have abandoned the language of Christ and opting, uh, opting for the language of the world, and when love has lost the meaning of sacrifice, Pier Giorgio truly teaches us the radicality of the Christian vocations while remaining connected to the world. Pier Giorgio truly understood the ugliness of sin, but the beauty of divine truth directed always his life. He is well known as to be a lover of the poor, to be a man of sacrifice, of great generosity, to go out and befriend people in the periphery. So Pier Giorgio is truly a great witness for us as we strive to live our lives as good Christians and also to extend our hands to others who are in need in a particular way throughout this time of pandemic. And our presenter tonight is Father David Belushi, a Dominican friar and priest, and also a professor. So Father Belushi is, as I said, an assistant professor of philosophy and theology at a local college, Catholic Pacific College. He is the author of several books. The most recent book is on the life of Pier Giorgio Frassati, entitled Truth, Love, and Sacrifice and was informally launched this summer in Rome on Pier Giorgio Frassati's um, Saint's Day, July 4th. Father Belushi teaches courses in ancient and medieval philosophy, including St. Thomas Aquinas, and as well as Christian ethics and scriptures. He holds a doctorate in philosophy uh, from the University of, uh, from the Dominican University College in Ottawa, where he also taught before coming to Vancouver. And he's originally from Vancouver and every summer father is going to Rome and he is a regular confessor at Santa Maria Maggiore there. So one of the most beautiful um, churches in Rome. So without further ado, I welcome father who will give us um, uh, great insights into the life of Pier Giorgio Frassati, and Father will also take questions at the end of his talk. So welcome, Father. It is wonderful to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Angela Marie, for having me as your guest. I'm delighted to be here to share my joy to talk about Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. Pier Giorgio tells us uh, in a letter that he had written to his sister, he tells uh, his sister that every Catholic cannot but be joyful. Sadness ought to be banished from Catholic souls. And what's interesting is that when Pier Giorgio writes this to his sister, he is suffering immensely. But what brings Pier Giorgio through is his faith. 
So this is the title of the presentation, Truth in the Beautiful. And it is separated into these four parts. The beautiful in terms of family relations, the beautiful in terms of the sacramental life, the beautiful in terms of friendships, and the beautiful in terms of charitable works. And at the end, what we really see in the life of Pier Giorgio is that truth in the beautiful is really Jesus who is truth. And Jesus who is truth shows Pier Giorgio the beauty in all these different dimensions. So we'll begin with Pier Giorgio's family. Now, the uh, material that I draw from is from my book. So you'll notice chapter references occasionally on the bottom right. And I have abbreviated this TLS from Truth, Love and Sacrifice. And this is based on chapters one and two. And I have here specifically for this evening's presentation, Pier Giorgio's family. Pier Giorgio was born in Turin, April 6, 1901. His mother is Adelaide Ametis, and she is an artist. His father, Alfredo Frassati, he is a lawyer. He's educated as a lawyer, but then he uh, moves into journalism. He is nominated Italian senator, and he's also ambassador of Italy to Germany. The Ametis family lived in Polone, which is not far from Turin. So this would be the mother's family. Um, Polone is about one hour or so from Turin. And the Frassati family lived right in Turin. Now, Pier Giorgio was very close to his family with his sister Luciana, his maternal grandmother and aunt. And we have here in the picture, Luciana on the very left, Pier Giorgio's father, Alfredo, then Pier Giorgio at the center, is probably about five years old, four years old in this picture. And then to the very right is his mother. Now Pier Giorgio was um, especially attached to his maternal grandmother, Linda Ametis. This is a picture of the two of them here the grandmother and Pier Giorgio, who was probably about two at this time. And the correspondence between Pier Giorgio and his grandmother shows how close he is to her and how much he cares about his relationship with her. Here we have a letter that is written um, around Christmas, December 1908, to his grandmother, Linda Ametis. And this is uh, one of Pier Giorgio's first letters. Dear grandmother, how are you? I am fine. I'm going to gymnastics and also to dance lessons. Is the weather nice in Polone? Come at Christmas and spend nice Christmas holidays with us. Yesterday, the weather was bad in Turin and today it is fine. The cat is sick. Many little kisses to you and grandfather, and from mama and papa and aunt, from your dear Pier Giorgio. So Pier Giorgio is writing to his grandmother when he is seven years old. The grandmother, she is at home in Polone, and Pier Giorgio often spent his vacations in Polone, usually the summertime, but sometimes during the year as well. The closeness in this relationship shows how he forms, informs his grandmother of his activities, gymnastics and dance. This bond reflected in his writing to her, keeping his grandmother updated. The significance in this early development in this relationship is recognizing the value, the value of family ties, the value of relationships. Not just someone his age, siblings he can play with, but in this case, his grandmother. The intergenerational ties that will lead Pier Giorgio as an adult to develop true and good friendships with people from different backgrounds, 
beautiful friendships. His friends are not just his school buddies. They are mountain climbers, painters, priests, from religious congregations, social political activists, and prayer partners for the rosary and Eucharistic adoration. So when we think of Pier Giorgio, this social person, joyful, connected to the people and the reality around him, this really begins in his childhood. Pier Giorgio in this December letter also sends his grandmother a Christmas invitation. He would like her to spend Christmas with them in Turin. The Christmas holidays together, he says, would be wonderful. Nostalgia of wanting to be with his grandmother, which is quite beautiful. And so he writes her this letter. So here we have Pier Giorgio with his sister Luciana and their pet dog. Luciana is about 15 months younger than Pier Giorgio. And they always um, had pets, either dogs or cats. And Pier Giorgio refers to them in his letters, asking how is the dog, how is the cat, naming them. And this is the um, family here, his, si his sibling, his one sibling, he only had one sister. And the two of them, Pier Giorgio and his sister Luciana, were very, very close. So what does Pier Giorgio acquire from his father in terms of values? Our parents are there to transmit values to us. And his father transmits to Pier Giorgio the sense of justice, right? the sense of justice, the sense of social responsibility. And we can see that from um, his father's profession, Alfredo's profession as a lawyer, then as a, as a journalist, being concerned about society and taking responsibility for how society can be improved. From his mother, Pier Giorgio acquires a sense of courage. From his mother, he acquires temperance. He learns the value of self-restraint. You cannot have whatever you want whenever you want it. And also the sense of the beautiful, because his mother as an artist had a re refined sense of, of color, of images, of texture, and these Pier Giorgio learned from his mother. The first mountain they climbed, Pier Giorgio along with his mother, he was eight years old. Okay. And um, Adelaide Ametis writes in her memoirs, and I have the quotation here, the crossing from the Teodulo with Pier Giorgio close to me by cord, right? Was close by, by cord. She did not want to lose her son on the mountain, of course, was rather tranquil, okay? And she writes this in her memoirs, and this would have been when Pier Giorgio was eight years old. So he learned quite young from his mother what it meant to climb a mountain uh, with great perseverance. It was a 10 hour climb and they spent a couple of days walking or hiking across the mountains. Now, the picture you have here is Mount Mucrone. Um, I use this picture for the cover of my book. This mountain is a mountain which Pier Giorgio could see from his room in Polone. And not far from Polone, there's a Marian shrine where Pier Giorgio also went to pray. And from that Marian shrine, you can actually have a good view of this mountain. In fact, from the Marian shrine, it's called Oropa, you can actually walk to the base of this mountain. And it's quite a magnificent sight on a clear day. So this mountain was in fact often a temptation for him because he would be in Polone, uh, perhaps studying, studying for exams, doing his homework, and then he'd look outside and he would see this mountain, and his temptation was to go climb the mountain. His sacramental life and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this is based on chapter four of my work, 
Pier Giorgio Frassati, Truth, Love, and Sacrifice. Pier Giorgio receives his first uh, Holy Communion, June 17th, 1911. So he is 10 years old when he has his first communion. And there is an interesting event that occurs only a few days before his communion. Now, Pier Giorgio was with his sister, Luciana, and Mère Sainte Catherine, who belonged to the Institute of the Helpers of Purgatory. And both were being prepared, both Pier Giorgio and Luciana were being prepared for their first communion by this sister who belonged to this institute. In fact, they had their first communion in the chapel of this institute. Now, while they were walking together, the viaticum was brought past them on the Corso Duca d'Aosta in Turin. So this is a, a main street in Turin and the viaticum was being brought past. And at the time when the viaticum was brought past, today they might still use a candle, but normally there is some sign that the real presence is coming by. So a bell or a candle. So the bell was ringing with the viaticum uh, being brought, brought by them. And Mère Saint-Catherine says, people should kneel, just as when a king walks past, right? I mean, after all, this is Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. The bell is ringing, we should be kneeling. And this is what she says. And Pier Giorgio cries out, let us kneel. It is right for a king. He is the king of kings. Now, we have this boy who has not yet received his first communion, and he already understands who Jesus is in the Blessed Sacrament. Let us kneel. He is the King of Kings. And the Solemnity of Christ the King was not yet part of the calendar. It's going to be promulgated in 1925, in the holy year of 1925. So this is Pier Giorgio's the re-instruction, no doubt he received from the sisters, but also his own intuition, right? Let us kneel. It is right for a king. He is the king of kings. So we see Pier Giorgio's intuitive understanding that we kneel for Christ our king. When Pier Giorgio is 14 years old, he has his confirmation. Now, Pier Giorgio was uh, studying in a state school called Massimo D'Azeglio. Right? He was there um, completing his studies. But his studies were interrupted at the state school because he had to repeat Latin. And in Italy at the time, if you have to repeat Latin, which is one course, you have to repeat the entire year, right? So he was supposed to repeat the entire year. And in order to do that, what his parents decided was it would be better simply to send him to a Jesuit institute called the Social Institute. And in 1913, Pier Giorgio's education moves from state education to Roman Catholic education, okay? And I think this is, um, a fundamental change that occurs in a spiritual life. In fact, one could say that it was providential he had to repeat Latin because uh, having to repeat Latin, which meant repeating the year, the parents put him in a Roman Catholic school. And there he received um, a Roman Catholic education, which had a significant impact on Pier Giorgio. The Jesuits in Turin at the time were both Eucharistic and Marian. So the emphasis on the Blessed Sacrament and the emphasis on Marian prayer. Frequent communion had just been uh, encouraged by Pope 
St. Pius X in 1908. In other words, just a few years bef before Pier Giorgio's first communion. So already there was the practice that was being encouraged of frequent communion. And with this practice, um, which Pier Giorgio began to uh, receive, frequent communion, he also understood if he is receiving frequent communion, then he should be receiving frequent confession. Okay. So with frequent communion, there is also frequent confession. Okay. The two sacraments go together. And this characterizes, if you want, this period while he is at the Social Institute, this Roman Catholic Institute, where he starts to increase the frequency of communion and of confession. So he's confirmed uh, June 10th, when he's 14 years old, at his parish church called La Crocetta. And already then, at 14 years old, he is engaged in an apostolate of prayer. He belongs to the Association of the Blessed Sacrament. He already has a devotion to Our Lady of Consolation in Turin. And when he is in Europa, he goes to the church early in the morning uh, for Mass. So we can see that at 14 years old, just um, at the time of his, at his, of his con uh, confirmation, he is already uh, living out a significant sacramental life. This is the shrine Our Lady of Europa. So I mentioned earlier that the mother's family is in Polone. Okay, Polone is not far from Turin. Turin is a major uh, northern Italian city. It is an industrial city, in fact, in the north. And from Turin to Polone, it's um, about one hour, uh, a one hour drive. And from Polone to Europa, it's about 20 minutes. So from Polone to Europa, it's very close. And you can do this, Pier Giorgio did this walking early in the morning so that he would be at the shrine on time for mass. So this shrine here is dedicated to Our Lady of Europa. It's a fairly old uh, shrine and an old Marian devotion, meaning that it has been here since the fifth century. Not this specific shrine, but the Marian devotion to Our Lady of Europa goes back to about the fifth century. And so the statue of Our Lady of Europa is kept here inside the, the, the shrine and inscribed on the top as you enter, just over the door is, O quam beatus, O beata, quem biderint oculi tui, Oh, blessed the one who will have set his eyes on you. All right. Here we have the other Marian shrine. Uh, this one is right in Turin. It's called Our Lady of Consolation. And Our Lady of Europa, the feast day is August 30th. Our Lady of Consolation, it's June 20th. And often... Blessed Pier Giorgio would speak about going to alla consolata, right? This was sort of his, his language, alla consolata, meaning that he was going to Our Lady of Consolation to pray. Right? So these were the two shrines where he um, frequently went for prayer, um, specifically for his devotions to the Virgin Mary. When Pier Giorgio is 16 years old, he receives a Christmas gift from his mother, l'imitazione di Cristo, the imitation of Christ. And she writes a note to her son, to her 16 year old son. And the note says, in reference to this particular book, which she gave him, that it may be a guide and comfort on the way of honesty, 
on the way of charity and of purity, right? In other words, of being honest, of being charitable, of being pure. Okay. This is what the um, path, the guide, the comfort that the imitation of Christ should bring him. And this is possible with the help of God, and he, she says, and with the blessing of your mother. So it shows that um, Adelaide Ametis, his mother, always had a concern uh, that Pier Giorgio, her son, would live a morally upright life. Now, this um, dedication, actually, uh, Wanda Gauranska, this is Pier Giorgio's niece, and she is living. She shared this dedication with me when I was in Rome. This is another um, example of Blessed Pier Giorgio's Marian piety, and this is based on the witness account of his sister, Luciana, it's in her, her own writings from a book called La Fede. And then I reference her in my own work, um, Truth, Love and Sacrifice. So this is what we have. The 18 year old's Marian piety had been witnessed at Loreto when Pier Giorgio disappeared. And here I quote Luciana, the sister, we could not find him in the hotel. We began to look for him everywhere, and we ended up finding him alone in the church, kneeling on the cold steps of the altar. He had felt such a strong attraction to the house of the Virgin that he could no longer resist staying in bed. All right, so the... Um, Devotion to Mary shows that Pier Giorgio's spiritual life continues to grow. Right? It develops, it strengthens through the sacraments, through the intercessory prayer of the Virgin Mary. It's kind of interesting because this is a question that comes up. Why did Pier Giorgio not become a priest? Right? The signs were there, the indications were there. So here, once again, I'm quoting from um, Luciana, his sister, from her work, La Fede, and this you'll find in my book. All signs would appear that his sacramental life was leading him in the direction of ordination. This is Luciana who's writing, who's saying this. Could these deep desires in Pier Giorgio, germinating toward religious life and holy orders, have been thwarted out of obedience to his mother. Pier Giorgio's sister seems to raise this possibility with regards to their mother, right? So this is what my observations are based on what I have read. And then here I introduce Luciana Frassati's um, quote, but she, she refers to the mother, but she did not realize that in the name of strict obedience, a certain spiritual yeast did not rise in us, especially in Pier Giorgio, who already most certainly held aspirations towards religious life and very beautiful moral ambitions. So Luciana notices that there is something uh, that stands out in her brother, what she refers to as beautiful moral ambitions. And that certainly may have been aspirations towards religious life. All right, so here we will have a look at Pier Giorgio's friendships. And this I cover in chapter six of my work. So I, I have here um, just a, a short quote. This is a, a much longer letter, but I have a short quote 
from a letter written to um, Carlo Bellingeri. Now I took this particular quote from this letter because it is the first letter that you find among his letters that is written to a friend. Before this letter, all his letters are written to family members, right? It could be um, his grandmother or his aunt or his mother or his father. But now we have a letter written to a friend and the letter is written when he is 16 years old. And what we find in the letter is this statement that I thought was significant. He says, I still think about the beautiful hours spent at the Boniface with you and the beautiful walks I took with you and Camillo. Okay. So Boniface is, uh, was an agricultural institute where he had studied in, um, for a very short time in 1917 because of the disruption caused by the First World War with the schools. So he studies at this institute and with him is his friend Camillo, but he looks back and this is characteristic of Pier Giorgio's letters and his writings. He looks back with gratitude, but also with nostalgia, right? With gratitude because he sees the, these beautiful moments together with his friends, but he also looks back with nostalgia. And we see this much more in his later letters when he knows that he will be separating from his university friends. So in 1918, when he's 17 years old, he goes to university, he goes to the Turin Polytech, and that's where he'll be studying right until 1925. And when he goes to the uh, Turin Polytech, his area of study is mining engineering. This is basically what he's majoring in, his area of specialization. And he participates in what is called the Federation of Italian Catholic Universities. Short, it's FUCI. And they have two clubs, one for men and one for women. The men belonged to the club called Cesare Balbo and the women called Gaetana Agnesi. So when you read his letters, what you find is reference to um, Cesare Balbo. So when you find this, it's basically referring to the Fucci Club at the University of uh, the Turin Polytech. Fucci Club, this is a, a Catholic club, right? These are, it's part of the Federation of Italian Catholic Universities. So these are the men, this would be the Cesare Balbo group. And right here at the very center is Pier Giorgio. Here we would have then an excursion of the Catholic University students. And clearly these are the men and the women. Uh, so the um, both of the uh, Fuji clubs at the Turin Polytech. So they go on an excursion, um, it could be a hike, it could be a walk through the woods, typically a picnic possibly stopping at one of these stone houses. Often they are uh, guest houses where they serve polenta, for example, a Northern Italian dish, especially in these um, regions, in the more mountainous regions, because it's a very hearty dish. Pier Giorgio even writes about it. And you have the men and the women then on this excursion. And uh, here in the center is the priest who is accompanying them. This is a Catholic group, so they're accompanied by their, by their chaplain. And Pier Giorgio is over here. Now, it's clearly not a mountain hike. They're not mountain climbing because Pier Giorgio is wearing a suit, and he would not be wearing a suit if this were um, mountain climbing. So it's clearly an excursion, perhaps even on a Sunday, where they're going out together after Mass, and um, he is... He's often formally dressed in um, suit and tie, and he's got his jacket over his backpack here. Okay. Uh, 
Now, many of the people who are familiar with Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati are also familiar with this group called the Shady Ones. Uh, in Italian, the Tipiloschi. Okay. Now, the group was founded uh, May 18th, 1924. So Pier Giorgio would have been um, 23 at the time. And the, the idea of the group was really to unite Catholics, to bring Catholics together because they share a common faith and where they could just have fun together, fun activities, doing, um, going for walks in the woods, in the mountains, picnics, this was a picnic but to share their faith and also to enjoy themselves. Really, it was the two uh, purposes of the, um, of the Tipiloski, the shady ones, bringing Catholics together and enjoying themselves. But the ultimate aim of the group for Pier Giorgio was leading, leading the members to eternal life. All right? It had a very clear spiritual uh, objective. The founders of the group then, um, in fact, the one who sort of spearheaded this group is Pier Giorgio, who's right here. And with his best friend or closest, well, one of his closest friends, he had many, many close friends, in fact, but many of the letters are addressed to Marco. This is Marco Beltramo over here. And you'll find many of his letters where he really opens himself up is to Marco Beltramo. So these are the two who, um, you might say they're the, 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 the ones who spearheaded this idea. And these are all the founding members. There are 10 of them. And from left, we have uh, Madalena Guglielmini, as I said, Marco Beltramo. This is another good friend of Pier Giorgio, Antonio Severi. Many of his letters are addressed to him. This is uh, Antonio Severi's sister. Then there is Ernestina Bonelli. She would be the one who is in charge of excursions, okay? They had a fairly formal structure. Um, there was someone who was in charge of excursions. They had a secretary and they had a president. This is Emilio Randone over here. This is Lara, who is the secretary. And this is, um, I don't know if I mentioned her, Ernestina Bonelli. She is the, um, yeah, the director of excursions. I mentioned that. This is another Ernest, uh, Ernestina, Ernestina um, Luoto, sorry, Clementina Luoto. Clementina Luoto, she is the president. Okay. And then this, uh, just beside Pier Giorgio here is the um, Giuseppe Grimaldi. Okay. So these would be the founding members. This is the founding day of the Tipiloski, May 18th, 1924. Okay. So they even have statutes. The statutes are somewhat satirical. They're really a reflection of this society, which is meant to uh, sort of have fun, right? The shady ones, these are hardly shady people, but this is sort of the satirical nature of the society. Now, I don't say anything about her in this particular presentation. I have spoken about her in the past. Um, I've given a, a young adults retreat with the Sisters of Life in Toronto, and that was over the whole weekend. So I was able to talk about her in more detail. But this is the one uh, woman who, whom Pierre Giorgio, if he were to have married, he would have most likely married her. Okay, so he was um, interested in her. Okay, and there's of course a, a story, um, a story that I could share at some point. All right, so what are the Tipiloski about? They are friends who were united by the Roman Catholic faith. This is fundamental to their identity. Enjoying mountains, excursions together, okay? They journey together towards eternal salvation. 
And the joy of being together was the fruit of the Catholic faith. For uh, Pier Giorgio, being a Catholic, for him, it was a joy. It was a joy, and this comes out repeatedly in his letters. Verso l'alto, ultimately, this is their direction, right? To the summit, the summit as a metaphor for God, ascending the mountain towards God, towards the summit, the summit of one's life. What does he write to Marco Beltramo? He says, you have stated very well that there will always be an indissoluble bond which will unite us forever. And this bond we hold is faith, which made us companions on beautiful trips and made it possible for our society to be founded on solid rock. So the society, the Tipiloski, they um, are founded on solid rock, which is their faith. And their faith means that their bonds are indissoluble. Now, this is important because it also means that they do not have to be physically together at all times. They know they will each be going their own way. Right? As much as they would like the presence of the other, the reality is each will have his own journey. Each will have her own journey. Okay? But the bond remains. The bond remains because of their faith. So um, here, when the, uh, Pier Giorgio is writing to Marco Beltramo, he's 23 years old, he is talking about living relationships at a spiritual level, or if you want, at a supernatural level by faith, right? Living these relationships, which are a bond that cannot be broken because they have this faith. So this is a, a very powerful statement that he is making in Marco's, um, in his letter to Marco, because he says, essentially, that when we have faith, our friendships remain, right? even if we are far apart. So his friend Marco, as I mentioned, Marco is one of his closer friends. He um, joins the Air Force and he's expecting to join between late autumn of 1924 or the early winter of 1925. And the patroness of pilots is Our Lady of Loreto. Okay. And we just celebrated her about a week ago, December 10th. Okay. If any of you have been at Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Rome, often referred to simply as Fumicino. As you um, approach the airport, just entering the airport, you will see a statue of Our Lady of Loreto. Okay, this is at Fumicino Airport in Rome. Why? She is the patroness of pilots. In other words, those who are flying, right? All right, so um, Pier Giorgio then writes to Marco, and says, then as soon as I get to Turin, I will send you a souvenir that let's hope should always bind the terror. This is like a nickname that they use for each other, right? Terror in a non-material way, non-material. So bound in a non-material, in other words, in a spiritual way. It is a rosary made of garden seeds and to which I shall add a medallion of the Madonna of Loreto, that the Virgin will protect you when you fly through the vast kingdom of the winds. So basically his closest friend is going to be leaving. Uh, well, one of his closest friends, he is in fact the first one to leave uh, from, this, from this group because he's now going to be joining the Air Force, and Pier Giorgio being the sensitive person he is, um, someone who is close to his friends, appreciates their presence, also recognizes that there is a non-material way in which the two can be united, and it is through the rosary. 
I shall add a medallion of the Madonna of Loreto. Okay. And this, I'm sure you all know, this is the Madonna of Loreto, her statue. And um, this is the statue you find in the shrine of Loreto. Social Justice and the Gospel of Salvation, right? So this is based on chapter seven of my book. And I actually call this chapter uh, Christian Democracy, okay? But for the presentation, um, I have it as Social Justice and the Gospel of Salvation. In 1921, um, Pier Giorgio is in Berlin Remember, his father is the ambassador of Italy to Germany. So when he goes to Berlin, when he goes to Germany, it's to visit his family. Um, but it's also to study German. Pier Giorgio had in mind to actually study in Germany. So he visits Germany several times. And in this 1921 visit, we can see that the result of this encounter with Father Zonenschein, already Pier Giorgio had this concern for the poor because of the activities he belonged to. This led to uh, social activism that was ultimately um, inspired by the gospel. Now, Father Zonenschein, who's a German priest, is really going to give Pier Giorgio guidance in the areas of social activism. Father Zonenschein is the chaplain for Catholic university students. Now the university students are suffering miserably, right? Remember, this is Germany after the First World War. So it's extremely difficult and Pier Giorgio is aware of it. And Pier Giorgio likes Father Zonenschein's model of ministry, a certain independence, the students and the workers come together. So it was uh, an educating uh, encounter for him while his meetings with Father Zonenschein. And Father Zonenschein was familiar with an Italian political economist called Giuseppe Tognolo. And Giuseppe Tognolo had written on Rerum Novarum. Rerum Novarum is the social encyclical that was uh, issued by Pope Leo XIII in 1891. And of course, this encyclical is going to draw from the gospel, okay? So Pier Giorgio's time um, in Berlin, his contacts with Father Zonenschein and of course others are going to help him um, deepen his understanding of the gospel and its application to helping people uh, in states of misery, helping the poor, in this case, even helping students, which he does through his, through the Fuchi. He also helps German students. He joins Pax Romana. In fact, Pier Giorgio is one of the founding members of Pax Romana, which is founded in, in Fribourg in 1921. And in uh, August, they have a convention in Ravenna. Right? So this is Pax Romana that will be having a convention with the university students, Catholic university students. And we can see then how his uh, social, political activism also is maturing. In the same year, 1921, um, at his home parish, La Crocetta, he establishes a Catholic action group there. Catholic action actually is international. Um, it's across Italy and it's uh, in many countries, but not all parishes have them. And so he introduced Catholic action into his home parish in 1921. And he gave the name of Catholic action in his parish, Milites Marie, meaning Soldiers of Mary. And Catholic action had essentially two, served two purposes. One was catechetical, basically where the people who belonged to this group would learn 
um, about their faith, about scriptures, and also pastoral, where they would reach out and try to do what they could for the poor. This is um, an important pontificate, Pius, Pope Pius XI, who is elected Pope in 1922. So Pier Giorgio is present during the election of Pope Pius XI. This papacy uh, is shortly after, starts shortly after the First World War. So Europe at this time had been ravaged by the effects of war, not just the physical effects, but the psychological effects. So in 1925, Pope Pius XI um, calls for a holy year. And the holy year has as a focus peace. Right? The theme, the focus for the holy year is peace. At the end of the Holy Year, he issues an encyclical called Quas Primas. And this here that I have uh, quoted is from the encyclical. Just to give you an idea, it's well, it's in my book as well. So people are aware of the emphasis on the emphasis um, on Jesus Christ as, as king, as king. We remember saying that these manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. That these had no place either in private affairs or in politics. And we said further, that as long as individuals and states refuse to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And it is Pope Pius XI who issues, who formalizes, the Solemnity of Christ the King, which we celebrated um, not too long ago, the Sunday before Advent. Right, so the language of Pope Pius XI's pontificate, especially the uh, marking the beginning of the Holy Year, is language that focuses on Christ as King and only Christ as king can bring peace to the world. And we find this reflecting Pier Giorgio's letters. So this is the image. There are many images of um, the Lord Jesus Christ as king, king of the universe. When I see this, in fact, when this uh, solemnity um, is celebrated, Pier Giorgio's words still come to my mind when he says to Sister Mary Catherine, let us kneel, he is the king of kings. Right? <laughs> so he writes to his friend Isidoro Bonini. And this is the very beginning of the holy year. We are in the holy year. And since the Vicar of Christ has opened the doors of justice, doors through which all of us ought to fortify ourselves in grace in order to obtain the eternal prize, how much misery there is, and unfortunately, good people are suffering. While we who have been given many graces by God have, alas, paid him back so poorly. The faith given to me in baptism suggests to me with a sure voice, by yourself, you can do nothing. But if you have God as the center of your every action, then yes, 
you will reach the goal. Okay. So we can see how Pier Giorgio is taking the holy year very seriously. And he is emphatic about fortifying himself. We can fortify ourselves in grace, in grace. In other words, even if there are struggles, even if there are struggles, which he knows very well, grace gives us the strength to obtain the eternal prize. We are not on our own. God gives us grace. And Pier Giorgio also has this sense of, have I really given God? Have I really thanked God for what I have received? The faith I received at baptism. He's very conscious of his baptism. He's very conscious of the faith that he was given as a result of his baptism. How has he paid God, how has he paid God back for what he has received? Okay. And he is always using language of hope. And the language of hope here is that with God as the center of your every action, then yes, you will reach your goal. So there is always this hope to continue, to continue. Okay. There is this possibility of, with God's grace, being able to reach this eternal prize. Jesus Christ is truth. All right, so um, this is the focus of my last chapter as well, um, which I refer to as Pier Giorgio's eschatological uh, beliefs. This is Pier Giorgio's notes on charity. This is delivered, again, it's the Jubilee year. It's delivered to the Fuchi students these uh, Catholic students. And this is what he writes. These are his notes on charity. Every one of you knows that the foundation of our religion is charity. With charity, peace is sown among men, but not the peace of the world. The peace which only faith in Jesus Christ can give, binding us together in brotherly love. But if we could plunge the depths of those who unfortunately follow the perverse ways of the world, we would see that there is never in them the serenity had by those who have faced thousands of difficulties and have renounced material pleasures in order to follow the laws of God. We have a strict duty to cooperate generously in the moral regeneration of society worldwide so that the radiant dawn may break in which all nations recognize Jesus Christ as King. As we grow closer to the poor little by little, we gain their confidence and can advise them in the most terrible moments of this earthly pilgrimage. We can give them the comforting words of faith. Then we resolve in our consciences to follow the way of the cross from then onward, the only way that leads us to eternal salvation. Okay. So he is um, writing. He is 23 years old here. It's the beginning of 1925. He will be 24 in April. What is remarkable in Pier Giorgio's thoughts is his... Um, understanding of Catholic theology. Okay. He hasn't studied theology as such, but he makes connections and he understands these connections. He writes to Isidoro Bonini, every sacrifice is worthwhile if only for that faith. As Catholics, we have a love which surpasses every other love. 
and which after that owed to God is immensely beautiful, just as our religion is beautiful. Pope Pius X of blessed memory recommended to youth to the, the practice of Holy Communion. And I cannot but give thanks to God at every moment for having given me parents, teachers, all friends, all of whom have guided me through the main path of the faith. So here, Pier Giorgio acknowledges how beautiful it is to be a Catholic and those who helped him, those who helped him on this path, parents, teachers, friends, all those who guided him. This is the well-known picture, um, Verso l'Alto, the one of which Angela Marie spoke at the beginning of the presentation. Verso l'Alto, to the summit. This is his last ascent. It is June 7th, 1925. And ascending the mountains, Pier Giorgio writes, is compl contemplating bliss. Okay, that is sublime beauty. Now on Friday, July 3rd, Pier Giorgio writes a note to his friend Giuseppe Grimaldi, and this is his note. This is not Pier Giorgio's normal writing. He is writing here in a state where he is semi-paralyzed. Right? His uh, body was experiencing paralysis. But on the Fridays, he uh, would go with Giuseppe Grimaldi as part of this St. Vincent conference to the poor, whether it was to just to talk to them, to bring them food or to bring them medications. But this was done on Fridays. On this particular Friday, July 3rd, he could not make it because of his condition. So he writes this note, which is given to Giuseppe Grimaldi. Here are the injections for Converso. Converso is one of the people whom they visit. Then the pawn tickets is Sapas. Sapa is also one of the individuals whom they visit. I forgot it, renew it in my name. Right? So Pier Giorgio in his uh, last moments of life is actually thinking about the people whom he was supposed to visit on that Friday and what he was supposed to bring them. Right? And so he asked Giuseppe to take care of this for him because he's not in a condition to, to leave his bed. And in fact, the following day at 7 p.m., Pier Giorgio dies. So in Polone, where the mother's family had their home, you can visit the, uh, not the entire residence, but you can visit Pier Giorgio's rooms. This room here is used as an oratory. This was his sister's room. And here on the left is where mass is celebrated. This would be a private mass, of course. Um, these are prayer requests. This is the last portrait of Pier Giorgio in the open coffin. And this is a crucifix, which uh, Pier Giorgio had given his sister when she got married. And so the sister placed it above her bed. So this room actually faces west. Pier Giorgio's room, uh, there is also a room that was Pier Giorgio's bedroom that can also be visited. That is the room that uh, faces north. If you um, go to Turin, and if you go to the cathedral, the cathedral of St. John the Baptist, there on the left side, as you enter, there is the altar that is dedicated to blessed Pier Giorgio.
so we can ask Pier Giorgio to pray for us. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. And on the left, you have the book cover, um, Truth, Love and Sacrifice. That really is about the life of Blessed Pier Giorgio. And this is the end of the um, presentation, the topic, Truth in the Beautiful. And if anybody wants to contact me, this is my Catholic Pacific College contact address. Now, if there are any questions, I think this is a time that we will be able to take questions. Thank you so much, Father Belushi, for a beautiful presentation. I truly enjoyed learning more about Pier Giorgio Frassati and also the beauty of the photos that you shared with us and your personal relationship with the people there in Italy who have known him. So thank you very much. Very and I see some questions just coming in, so I will look at a few of them. Uh, first one, was there ever any connection to Ireland or Irish influence in Pier Giorgio's life? Not that I know of. Um, nothing that I have read has made any reference to Ireland, not in any of the letters that I, that I know or that I'm familiar with. Mm, very good. And the next question that came in is, can you tell us about his late Dominican fraternity? Right. Okay. There is, um, there is a complete chapter on Pier Giorgio's spirituality. And uh, what I show in the chapter is that Pier Giorgio, his, his, spiritual, his spirituality is clearly Dominican. His contacts with the Dominicans begin with the chaplain. They had a Dominican chaplain at uh, a club he belonged to called the Savonarola Club in uh, Turin. So his involvement begins with the chaplain who, um, uh, who guides Pier Giorgio with his questions concerning different social justice uh, topics. And through this particular chaplain, the, tour, the Dominicans had a, a community in Turin. And uh, with this chaplain, then he gets to know the Dominicans and he eventually joins the Dominicans as a lay Dominican. And the reason why he joins the lay Dominicans is Pier Giorgio wants to be really close to the poor and he's convinced that he can be closer to the poor and do more for them by being with them. Um, remember, his area of study is mining engineering. He wants to actually work with the miners. That's why he uh, pursues studies in mining engineering. His, his desire is to be among the miners, and he believes that it would be easier to be among the miners as a layperson than as um, an actual um, ordained uh, or religious brother or an ordained priest. So he remains a, a lay person, but um, actively engaged and actively committed to Dominican spiritual life. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, there are some questions around his uh, possible canonization. And maybe if you can speak briefly about what brought the church to beatify Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati in 1990, by St. John Paul II, and then maybe if there is a possibility for his canonization and where the works are at at this point. Okay, um, well, for uh, canonization, there needs to be a second miracle. So um, the second miracle has not yet been uh, validated. You, you need, as you know, for canonization, there is a process that involves not just a miracle, but validating that the that the this is in fact a miracle, that there is no medical or scientific explanation for this. So we're not at that stage. The miracle for which he was beatified involved um, this this individual uh, whose name is Domenico Celan, and he was born in 1892, and he uh, suffered from what was called POTS disease. And with a, a relic of Blessed Pier Giorgio that had been given to him, 
um, he was completely healed of this disease. It was a permanent healing of the disease. And um, as a result of this particular healing, the um, miracle that was recognized became the basis of the beatification for the first miracle that was needed. And some questions seem to, some several people actually seem to be very interested um, about his relationship with a young woman from the T.P. Losky group. So what was their relationship like? Was he really interested in her? And where did things go from their encounter? Right. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually a very beautiful relationship because you see a whole different side to Pier Giorgio, which is this incredibly discreet person when it comes to being involved in a relationship. Basically, nobody knew that he was even interested in her. Her name is Lara, uh, Laura. Uh, nobody even knew about it. That's how discreet he was uh, about this relationship. He did not want to make anything public until he knew how his mother would feel about her. For him, then, the main issue was, there is this girl. I like her. I'm attracted to her. I would like to possibly consider a future with her. But the big question is, how does mom feel about her? Okay. This was um, the point that would determine whether Pier Giorgio would pursue this relationship or not. So he and his sister, um, they devised something of a plan the sister, uh, Luciana, and as I mentioned, he was very close to his sister. Uh, the plan was that she would, Luciana would invite Laura over for tea. Pier Giorgio would not be there. It would be just the two of them. And the mother would also be there. So during tea, Luciana was supposed to observe the mother's reaction to Laura. So based on this one event, um, and Luciana tells Pier Giorgio, it is a negative verdict. Those are the words that she uses when she writes about this. Uh, it's a negative verdict, meaning that this uh, relationship cannot take off. The marriage will not happen. It is a negative verdict. So from that point onwards, Pier Giorgio uh, essentially distanced himself from her. It was very difficult. We see that in his writings, he is really suffering. Mm -hmm. It's very painful for him, um, but he believes that he does not want to make a decision that could offend his mother. He loves his mother and he associates this with the fourth commandment. Um, he took the fourth commandment very seriously, honoring my father and my mother. And Pier Giorgio loved his parents. He would not do something that could offend them in this way. And this concerned the mother. And um, once he knew of his mother's reaction, based on what Luciana had told him, he distanced himself from her. And we see in his letters how painful this is. Excellent. So following um, with that question, there is another one that kind of ties into it. And um, our attendee asks, how can Pier Giorgio Frassati teach us about purity and chastity of heart? Okay, that's um, a good question. And I think this question is so pertinent in our society today, because um, our society seems to have lost the meaning of purity and the meaning of chastity of heart. So what Pier Giorgio tells us is, um, first of all, the way we live our relationships. We live our relationships in a way that is detached, in a way that we build uh, the person, uh, we build the person in a way, or we build the relationship in a way that the person can journey towards God. So there's, there's a sense of selflessness in Pier Giorgio's relationships. He's very giving. Uh, 
but the um, relationship is understood in a way that this person really belongs to God. We don't have a sense of uh, a possessiveness, but rather a detachment. So I think detachment would be the first thing. I mean, you can love someone, you can appreciate their presence, but it doesn't mean you have to possess them. And Pierre Giorgio has this spirit of detachment, the way he is willing to sacrifice this potential marriage uh, partner, um, Laura, because he realizes it could cause a serious problem in the family. So this is possible with a spirit of detachment, but knowing that the spirit of detachment is ultimately for the person's good, for the person's sanctity, right? Um, so you're thinking about the other, what is good for the other, all right? How is the other growing in holiness and in sanctity? And this is what Pier Giorgio is doing. He wants the person to journey in their Catholic faith and to grow in sanctity. So detachment um, and thinking in terms of what is good for the other. This is what Pier Giorgio does. And Father, would you please elaborate a little more about the last uh, days of Pier Giorgio's life? What was his illness, the reason for his death? and a little bit about the funeral we kind of some some of us know that there were so so many people that came at his funeral and the family itself was very very surprised about that yes yeah, so um just so you know that my book actually ends with pierre giorgio's death i do not really go beyond his death so everything that happens afterwards such as the uh, funeral details. I don't look at that at all. I look strictly at how Pio Giorgio lived his life right up to his death and what the witnesses had to say about Pio Giorgio while he was living. What I can say about um, the, the death is they, uh, how Pio Giorgio died is that um, nobody actually thought that he was dying because you have here someone who is young, strong, healthy. Uh, you just do not think that this person is dying. You think that maybe he's, you know, if, if he is, if, his, has, if, he, if he has body aches, his body aches could have been from, you know, anything from skiing, from running, from all the different um, athletic activities that he does. You don't think that the person is dying. You think these are just normal body aches from, perhaps over-exercising. So the, the, the seriousness of his condition was not recognized. Um, this, was the first, this was the first problem because they did not, uh, otherwise they would have called a doctor much earlier, but they waited really until the situation had become so degenerated that uh, then they called the doctor, but it was really too late. So the first thing was they did not realize the severity of his condition. The second is, at the same time as um, Pier Giorgio's death, the sorry Pier Giorgio's um, illness or condition, his rapidly deteriorating condition, his grandmother actually died. Uh, remember, I said he was very close to his grandmother uh, Linda Amatis. So Linda, the grandmother actually died while Pier Giorgio was in this um, rapidly degenerating condition. But what this means is that the family then, their attention is focused on the grandmother's funeral. Right? This means that um, they're, remember, they're caught between Turin and Polone. So you have the family who is going to the funeral and the other family members, well, should anybody even remain behind for Pier Giorgio? He's a young, strong, healthy person. So it seemed he should be able to take care of himself, what probably seemed like um, just body aches. And uh, so the family was really caught up with the grandmother's funeral. And the mother uh, decided, it was sort of a, a last minute decision where she decided that it's better if she would remain with Pier Giorgio. Remember, this is her own mother who, who had passed away. Um, but she decides it's better for her to stay with Pier Giorgio and she did. 
And then, um, of course, when the doctors did show up, when the doctor did show up, it was uh, too late, really, to to do anything that could help Pier Giorgio. He had polio, his body was uh, paralyzed, and the paralysis was um, intensifying. The only thing they could do was uh, call the priest to uh, give him extreme unction, which they had done. And uh, he died by the evening, uh, July uh, 4th in the evening, he had finally passed away. I'm sorry, I was muted. So the question is, how did you come to know and love Pier Giorgio Frassati? Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, being a Dominican, I was looking for a Dominican figure who would um, help the youth, uh, who would be a model for the youth. But I thought it would be nice to have someone um, from my own order. And... Um, when I first came across Pier Giorgio Frassati, I really, and I found out he was a Dominican. I mean, I was thinking, what, why is he a Dominican? I, I really did not know very much about him, let alone the fact that he was a Dominican. So this led me to, uh, actually led me to uh, discovering more deeply uh, Dominican spirituality, because as I looked at his life, as I looked at his writings, as I looked at his the saints that um, to whom he had been drawn, these were all within, you know, a, a Dominican uh, charism, and it actually deepened my understanding. Not even, not only of um, Blessed Pier Giorgio's Dominican spirituality, but just Dominican spirituality in itself. So it was the result of looking for um, uh, a Dominican figure whom I could have as a point of reference. You know, working with youth whether it was at college or um, in, in formation. And, um, and then I discovered this uh, great saint. And Father, were there any other influences from the St. Vincent de Paul Society in Pier Giorgio Frassati's life? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the question. Any other influences? Yeah, it's, it seems like maybe someone um, thinks that there is a connection between the St. Vincent de Paul Society and Pier Giorgio Frassati or... Oh yeah, okay, I see. I under, Okay, I see the question now. Mm -hmm. So the St. Um, Pier Giorgio was um, active in these charitable works that were... Uh, sponsored by the St. Vincent uh, conferences. They're called the conferences. In, in the Italian, he refers to the conferences or the St. Vincent conferences. So yes, he first comes across them, um, uh, learns about them when he is studying with the Jesuits, um, the, the, the second period, that second phase when he is studying with the, the Jesuits. He comes across the um, St. Vincent conferences, and that's where he gets involved with them. And um, he then introduces these same conferences. He learns about them at the Social Institute, and then he introduces them while he is a university student. Um, as, a, as a Fuji member, he introduces the St. Vincent de Paul, or what he calls St. Vincent conferences, to the university. Um, so that the students themselves can also participate in these charitable works. Charitable works for Pier Giorgio uh, were very important. They were a, a very concrete way of expressing um, one's faith, acts or works of charity or works of mercy. And so he establishes um, with others um, a group at the university. So he starts with the St. Vincent de Paul Society, with the conferences at the Social Institute, um, which is where he is doing his, his high school, his senior years, his liceo, as they call it in Italian. And then he starts leaving the Social Institute. He then starts um, a new 
foundation of the St. Vincent conferences at the university. And during this time of pandemic, Father, how do you see Pier Giorgio Frassati being such a great example and model for us? Oh, that's a, a good question. Um, remember that Pier Giorgio, what characterizes him is he is a person of hope and he is a person of joy. So he does not uh, allow himself to be demoralized by what he hears or what he sees. It could be the reality in which he is living. Uh, he is aware of the effects, for example, of the, the First World War when he is in Germany. He sees what has happened to the German economy. He even writes about it. He sees the effects of um, the industrialized part of Italy, the northern part of Italy, when people go there and they do not find work or they do not find adequate housing. He sees this is the reality in which he lives, but um, he doesn't allow, he doesn't get discouraged. He is always hopeful and always joyful. He can see that with, uh, with faith, and he's emphatic about faith, with faith you can see, um, you can look ahead and you can look ahead joyfully. Thank you, Father. So I think we are at the end of our evening together. And thank you so much for sharing your love and passion for Pier Giorgio Frassati and also for uh, your very um, beautiful explanation of his life. Thank you for answering the question. And thank you for all of you who have attended our events tonight from our archdiocese. But I want to welcome in a particular way a group of young adults that is joining us from Prince George and they're going to have a little discussion after your presentation tonight. So please know that your words and uh, your sharing tonight have enriched many of us, and we're very, very blessed to know more about the saints than now we can pray to you and for. And so I wait uh, with great joy for hopefully his canonization soon. Before we end our evening together, we would like to share with you some of our um, upcoming events. So as we um, return after after during, yes, the Christmas celebration, we will have again Father Nick Meisel that will present on the Gospel of Matthew. So as you know, many of you have attended the presentation of the Gospel of Mark and then the Gospel of Luke. Father will follow up with the Gospel of Matthew on January 9th. So please join us. Uh, Father will investigate the brilliant way in which the Gospel of Matthew uh, describes the person and the mission of Jesus. So please join us on January 9th. And then our next session for Into the Deep, we'll see um, an event that will focus on the latest encyclical of Pope Francis, Fratelli Tutti. And in this presentation, we will see again, Father Nick Meisel and uh, the assistant professor, Nick Olkovich. Both of them do teach at Corpus Christi and St. Mark's College and will share with us the vision on fraternity and social friendship and give us an overview of this newest encyclical from Pope Francis that was just released a few weeks ago. So please join us for both of these events. And uh, we'll conclude tonight with Father Belushi reciting a prayer, a final prayer for us, and also giving us his final priestly blessing. So thank you so much, Father, and thank you for all of you for attending tonight. And please know of our prayers, especially as we move closer to the celebration of the incarnation of our Lord at Christmas. So may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the splendor of creation, in the beauty of human life. Touched by your hand, our world is holy. Inspired by the example of blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati, help us to cherish the gifts that surround us, to share your blessings with our brothers and sisters, and to experience the joy of life in your presence, especially as we approach Christmas. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>